Okay, folks, good afternoon to you all. Great attendance here for Saturday afternoon. Today we're going to be talking about something a little bit different, a little bit off standard, something that's not quite so predominant in, in the expedition. This, of course, is an IOTA, the expedition. It's a bit different than to be flying into a DXTC entity with an airport and with facilities and whatnot. So this is uh, the expedition that took place last October in the Caribbean. It's one of the new IOTAs was was announced. So where are we heading? We're heading here to this region. It's a close up here, it's one of the Caribbean islands and it is, it is a little bit different because it is actually an island off an island. And here we go, this is of course is uh, St. Martin, our Dutch St. Martin. Uh, one island occupied by two independent countries, both very similar, both very different. And this is where we're going to this little speck here, just on the, on the southeast corner of it. Um, so yeah, it's one of the new 11 IOTA groups that was announced last July in, in Windsor. It's um, for the 50th anniversary of the program. It qualifies as a new coastal island group of a split sovereignty island. It's now named on Google Earth and Google Maps for the first time on a one is to one million <coughs> scale. And therefore, the new St. Uh, Martin Islands group was born. And now there's only two islands qualify in this new group. You'd be Mali Bidet and Guyana Key of Pelican, which is also known as Pelican Key. Here is exactly where we're going. This is Mali Bidet. And this piece of rock here was yeah, what brought us to the other side of the, uh, the globe for. And you can actually see here, this, this photograph was taken here from the mainland. So, you know, it, it is quite close, but to actually get there by boat, it's over four nautical miles by sea. So just something quite unique about doing a first IOTA activation. You see, this is something that's never been done before. You have nobody to uh, get resources. You've no resources. You've got very little information, or practically no information in this case. Even, even, even the locals don't even go to this island. You've got no past experiences. You've no one to call on for any hints or tips or advice or anything. And yeah, so basically, <laughs> apart from because it's it's now listed on on Google Maps, but all we had was only four photographs really, and that's so armed with these four photographs. We, we jetted off to the Caribbean with these four pictures, knowing exactly what we were going to do. That's one picture. You can just see here quite easily the proximity of the mainland. And that's the rock up close. Now nearly every picture you will see this swell and this uh, surf around the rock. So meet the team. We've Dom, 3Z9DX, 3Zulu9 Delta X-ray, who's uh, just after uh, operation from Tango India 9. He has recently just announced <coughs> plans to, uh, for P5 for North Korea in, in, in January. Definite concrete plans, which is, is going ahead. The paperwork is in place. We have Jeremy, Echo India 5 Golf Mike, who can't be here today. Myself, EI9 FBB. We have friends, J69 Delta Sierra. And of course, uh, call MM0 NDX, a familiar call sign for most of you was the, the mastermind and the brains behind this. So basically the five of us, we, we were all, all coming from different parts of the globe, all transiting through different airports, and um, let the story begin. Carl was coming from Scotland, myself and Jeremy, of course, here from Cork. Dom, even though he's Polish, he, he lives in Brazil. And um, Franz, being, being the local guy, it actually took him longer coming from St. Lucia than it took for, for, for the rest of us coming from different continents. So we all met at Princess Juliana <laughs> Airport. This, this, so uh, our flight arrived literally within 10 minutes of Dom. Dom had to transit through Panama. His, his uh, plane got diverted, looking a little bit tired here. But we all arrived more or less within, within minutes of each other, which was great. And immediately we decided to put the plan into operation because we had a plan, believe it or not. We had a very good plan. And like all things that are planned well, they always go according to plan. But this wasn't any ordinary plan. 
to say we had a foolproof plan and, and this plan could not go wrong that's so we thought we had a license we had a captain we had a bit of money in our pocket we knew what we wanted to do we knew where we wanted to go and it was our plan to charter a yacht to sail out to the island to use this yacht as our base and then to get a small rib to commute backwards and forwards from the rock so the yacht would be used for our sleeping eating whatnots and just change <coughs> of operators then using the rib just that's it just that easy so that simple so yeah once we arrived we had transport arranged for us and we visited many marinas we, we uh, thankfully the island is, is small and as, as I say there's, there's two sides to the island you have the friend side and, uh, and the dirt side so we weren't fussy about where we got a boat so being an island of course tis, tis, a, tis a millionaire's playground really with all these luxurious yachts super yachts cruisers some very nice marinas and then some not so nice marinas with some not so nice boats on it <coughs> And what we wanted to do, we wanted to uh, get the boat. We had looked at various websites before we left. And um, basically, this was off season. There's thousands and thousands of boats available here. And we, we all agreed that if we arrived there, that we could actually get a very good cash deal on the boat. We didn't know exactly what kind of boat we wanted. And Dom, our captain, he has, he has a captain's ticket from anything, literally from a, from a dinghy to an oil rig. He has a skipper's ticket and, you know, so that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to, to uh, rent out a boat and uh, Dom being, being the captain on, on it. And everybody refused to go down this route because they didn't want any of our money, believe it or not. They had the boats, they didn't want the money. They wanted us to follow procedure and what we were doing was not following procedure. And what we had to do to get a boat, we had to <coughs> go to the marina, pick out a boat, we had to actually book it online, we had to pay for it online. The, of course, these uh, companies are only agents, of course, They're, they work on, on commission. So then they have to submit our application to the person who owns the boat. Quite often, it's, it's uh, American visitors who actually rent out the boat when, when they're not in, 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 in residence on the island. So we have to wait for our approval then the boat has to be cleaned and serviced and we might get a boat within a week's time because there's literally no way to get a boat on, on, on the spot. So thankfully friends had, had family on, on the island and a friend of a friend had, uh, he hadn't only one boat but he had two boats you can see here in the picture and basically we had to decide which boat we wanted. So we picked out the boat and we immediately uh, set out to uh, go to Pelican to actually circle it to uh, go around it and as we were leaving the marina uh, basically a <laughs> uh, second now here we can see it's, 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 you know there was uh, a little problem the the boat started overheating and it, it, uh, it started smoking and it was um, so we said we would continue for, for a little while and the more we went, the smoke got worse. So here we can see <laughs> thick, thick black smoke. <laughs> so we had no choice but to turn around and to come back. We came back to Simpson Bay. The boat we had picked was the wrong boat. We actually discovered that this boat isn't used very often, that he actually lives in this boat, and it's the other boat he uses. So we, we knew where there was a second boat, so we had to return to Simpson Bay. We, we went back, <coughs> and we basically exchanged boats. And the second boat didn't materialise either. Once again, we were leaving the bay. The, the second boat overheated. Uh, we had to um, pull over at, at a nearby jetty, wait for it to cool down. And basically, this day was a complete waste of a day. We couldn't get a boat. The following day, we went looking again. We noticed this place, which we, we actually noticed the previous day. Now, this boat, uh, this company have boats but they don't let you take a boat, you have to use their captain. So uh, you can't just rent a boat and, and drive it yourself. But yeah, there was no problem. Now, uh, Phyllisburg in St. Martin, it's um, it is a very plush area. It's, it's a tax-free haven. 
It's, as I mentioned earlier, it's a millionaire's playground. You some of the fame, rich and famous film stars and movie stars coming in there. And you also have cruise ships coming in there. And there's six or 700 cruise ships coming a season here. Sometimes there's four or five cruise ships, each carrying four and 5,000 passengers. And these days, Phyllisburg, it's the capital, it's, it's literally alive and buzzing. The other days, some shops don't even open. So they literally make hay when the tourists come in. And it just so happened that this day was not a cruise ship day. And they had a boat, and they had a skipper, and the boat was available. So here we go in this luxurious rib. It had a twin 400 horsepower Yamahas in the back of it. And uh, we, we were able to charter out this, this rib for an hour, hour and a half, and we, uh, we set out. And what we wanted to do, we wanted to get the recce trip down to Pelican, because uh, still at this stage we'd only seen it in photographs and from the mainland. So this is the first glimpse of Pelican. So we circled it several times, we photographed it, we uh, discussed various landing possibilities. And yeah, after a small while we actually identified a, a landing spot. And this was the landing spot here that we had uh, picked on. Just some more snaps of it. It's a close-up here on, on the, the landing spot. So literally within the space of an hour, we had gone out to Pelican, circled it several times. We had identified what we wanted to do, and we had come back. As I say, a twin 400 horsepower rib moves very, very fast. So then we had to get a new plan of action, and we, we, you know, it, it was, it, it, it was evident at this stage that we also needed a ground crew, that uh, it was just too difficult for five guys to actually arrive in this, on this rock. So um, the big yellow rib was available for the whole day. So uh, I'm just skipping through this here. But Franz had a nephew who had a small rib that, that we could also rent out for quite an extortionate fee, but he had us over a barrel, really. So, yeah, we uh, split up into, into two teams. Uh, two guys went to get the, uh, 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 the small rib, the rest of us, we still had, had, had some supplies to actually purchase that we had, we had left on, like tables and chairs and generators to sort and whatnot. And it was the plan to meet back here in the afternoon. So immediately the two teams split up. One team went here to several warehouses and cash and carries, got everything we needed to do, food, supplies, uh, water for um, five guys. And this previous place actually was, was a superstore here. It, it, it had everything from a needle to an anchor in it. And the shortfall really, we just picked up locally here in this little place. So here we are back at the marina. And immediately we start, uh, we get the supplies delivered here to the marina. We, we start loading the yacht with it. And we're waiting for friends and Dom who have gone to get the small rib to actually come back so we can start heading off. And we're waiting, and we're waiting, and we're waiting. And they never arrive. It just turns out that the small rib has also broken down. And not only that, it broke down out in the middle of, 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 of the harbour and they were about two hours waiting for somebody to come to rescue them. So unfortunately, it was evening time now, more or less, or very, very soon, and it, it was too late. So this was the second day now down the drain, basically. It's getting dark. So that was the problem. The problem was, was that the following day, the big rib wasn't available, it was cruise ship day, and we couldn't get it. So it looked like as if uh, things were not going to mat materialise. <coughs> Dom thankfully has some mechanical skills, and he started working on various boats throughout the course of the night. And the rest of us wake up in the morning and we learn that um, the rib has now been repaired. And not only that, but remember the boat that was blowing all the smoke? He fixed that as well. And that might have been, uh, this might be our only possibility to actually, uh, to actually start heading off to the, to the rock. It's the last chance we have, is either this or else come, come back home. And so we're not convinced exactly, a little bit skeptical about the safety of the boat and, and whatnots, but. 
So after breakfast, we organise we we organise the truck. We start loading it, like of, of, of course, with, with with everything. And um, now there was two stations came from Europe. Myself and Jeremy were both independent. We had our own rig, our own antennas. The third station, Col brought with him. The other two guys literally were were, were just uh, you know using our our stations. So. We had suitcases, we had the equipment that we had bought locally, and we also had our own food and, and drinks and, and tents and whatnots. Now, the other marina was several miles away from where we were staying, so this truck had to bring everything down here. So, yeah, once we arrive, we, we start loading the boat. There's some of the equipment. Friends and Dom following the small rib. Yeah, they are. And very soon we come up close to the rock. Pelican is inside. But the weather turned the night beforehand. There was a very bad turn of the storm. We were thankfully that we didn't actually get out the previous day in the rock. There was very bad lightning, torrential rain. And as a result, as we get closer, there was actually quite a lot of swell now on the island. So it was a lot more difficult to land. And our possible landing spot was now not so possible. It was very, very, uh, very difficult. So we circled the rock again several times, trying to look for the best landing spot. And unfortunately, there wasn't any. So near and yet so far. Now this very nearly didn't happen. This was, was literally, it was the first activation again. It hadn't been done and we were, we were at the rock and the difficulty we now had was actually taking the last leap, taking the last step to actually get on the rock. So we couldn't land. It was too dangerous. If only there was someone on the rock to throw a rope to. We were using the small rib to actually get in closer, but the rocks are very sharp and jagged. And what we wanted to do, if there was somebody on the rock that we could throw a rope to, that they could actually pull in the rib closer and keep it steady. And yeah, okay, you know, um, the main concern here was actually trying to lend the equipment. It was at this point when Jeremy 5GM jumped in and just swam to the rock. But then we had a man on the rock. We had a man to throw a rope to and to pull the, pull the rib in close. And because of this, three men from the rib were able to land. Myself and Carl were still back on, on, on the main ship. They covered the rock from top to bottom and it was impossible to land all the needed equipment, people safely. It was practically guaranteed that something would uh, end up in the sea. So now we had three guys on the rock and still the operation couldn't happen. Once again, so near and yet so far. So they sent a skipper back to us just to tell us that, okay, it's too difficult, guys, it's not going to happen. When um, we kind of realized that, okay, well, the hard bit is actually done. We have three guys here actually on the rock. If we could only hand them a station. Now, IOTA requirements are for a first activation, you have to make a minimum of 1,000 QSOs from five different continents. And if we could just hand them a station very, very quickly, just to make the needed 1,000 QSOs and get the hell off the rock, that was our plan. Now, thankfully, I had repacked just the night before because of airline regulations and whatnot. So I had a, a waterproof suitcase with one complete station in it, with an antenna, coax, rig, power supplies, uh, laptop, headset, CW key, everything. So we said we would try to land that suitcase. But then we got a brainwave. We said, OK, we'll actually land the generator first of all. Because if we can't land the generator, without a generator, we can't do anything. So we tried to land it. Of course, the generator was the biggest and the heaviest object, apart from myself, to try to land in the rock. So um, that's what we decided on. So this was the turning point, really, of the operation. That was the generator on the rock, the most difficult item to land. And lo and behold, the rib came up. Jeremy, uh, Dom, and friends were convinced they were coming off. And uh, they were waiting for the rib to come back and collect them. And instead of collecting them, they were firing them a generator. And Dom is a big, he's a 
Polish guy. He's uh, military trained. He's a uh, he actually rows now for the Brazilian rowing team. He's a very strong, fit guy, and he was able to get the generator in one hand and the catch it and the throw it to Jeremy and Jeremy and between the three of them they landed it on the rock. So we knew it was possible at this stage now to safely land stuff on the rock. So they came back, my suitcase went next, and then there was one station. And of course then we decided that okay, if there only there was a second station, two stations will do twice the business, twice as fast. So we got a second station over in the rock. So that was basically it. We needed to make the required 1,000 QSOs. Several crossings were backwards and forwards, and eventually we did get to uh, two stations on the rock. Now, we also needed a ground crew, as they say. So we formed a chain. Now, forming a chain, we were standing waist deep in, in water, trying to hold the suitcases and equipment up. We formed a chain, literally. And the first landing spot on the rock was at about a 45 degree angle, and it was covered in seaweed. Now, we were warned to keep our shoes on. Now, we weren't told why until afterwards, but there's poisonous sea urchins hiding in the holes in the rocks, and the poisonous needles, and if you stand on, you, you, you stand on one of the poison needles, and so yeah, that's basically how we got everything on, 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 on the rock. Here's a close up here of the, so the rib came in about here, we formed a chain up here, and this is the first, the, this is the first landing spot here really. Risk of falling is very, very high, covered in seaweed and the sea urchins. So we landed the bare equipment really just to make the 1,000 QSOs. We didn't land any of the luxury items there. We had a bucket of ice, for example, and that never made it to the rock. We needed a ground crew. Pardon? Tea bags. Oh, tea bags, yeah. If only we'd a kettle, yeah. So, yeah. So we needed a ground crew because of the difficulties with the boat. We needed somebody that we could rely on and, uh, and depend on, not just a guy from a shipping charter, boat charter company to come back out and collect us. So friends and, and Carl both volunteered, basically. So unsure of when or how we were to get off again, Carl and friends headed back to the mainland, and Jeremy, Dom and myself were on this rock. And it was at this point we actually realised, OK, that we're... we're we're actually very alone here. So rather than waste time setting up a nice comfortable station and whatnot, so we just got on the rock, got up high enough literally that when the high tide came up that you know it wouldn't be affecting us. And we we um we set up the stations here more or less immediately. The generator away. The problem we had with the generator was the fumes actually, no matter which way the, the wind was blowing, the fumes were, you know, and yeah. So this is our 30 meter vertical, 17 meter vertical dipole. They were the two main bands that we had uh, decided on. And within an hour of, of us landing on the rock, the first station was, was on the air. I started off in 17, 17 <coughs> meters phone, and Jeremy followed uh, about 15 minutes afterwards on 30 CW. And the band was very, very busy. Conditions were absolutely excellent. I was struggling trying to find a clear spot on 17. There were signals coming from everywhere. Really, the Caribbean was, you know, it was, it was, you know, whether it was just sunspots, but the band was absolutely buzzing. And we were CQing and CQing and CQing. And for 12 minutes of unanswered CQs, nobody came back. Of course, then things started racing through our head. Uh, were we not getting out very well? Did we have bad audio? And what do you do in this circumstance? You can't, uh, you can't <coughs> self-spot yourself. You don't have any, any internet access. So at least on CW, there's a good possibility that if you're sending accurately enough that a, uh, a beacon or a you know, reverse beacon or, or a skimmer will actually pick you up. But on SSB, it is actually quite difficult just to get noticed. So what we did was we just uh, trawled up and down the band. I picked out two very, very loud guys, and I just broke in, in that, their conversation. And the first guy that we worked was Gert Papa Alpha Thule Masker. Might be a familiar call sign for many of you. And he was actually aware of our operation. He was waiting for us. And we were supposed to be QRV two days previous, but with the difficulties, we weren't. And he was a little bit skeptical. He was a little bit amazed about, OK, he, had, he was prepared to spend hours in the pile up trying to work us, and now this is us calling him instead. 
So I asked him to cue us why he backed down to 18, 130, where we had been. He took a little bit of uh, convincing, but he realised who I was and, uh, and whatnot, and that you know, we were actually on the rock. And I asked him to uh, spot us on the cluster. And literally within 30 seconds, you could hear the growling and the grumbling of uh, people tuning up and you know, QSY and, and tuning amplifiers and antennas changing direction. And within 30 seconds of being spotted on, on the cluster, the pileups began immediately. So our, uh, our main objective here, once again, was to make the 1,000 QSOs. It was very, very hot. We actually um, built our station between two rocks. Now, we did this <coughs> for two reasons, mainly. First of all, it was quite close to the, uh, to the landing spot. And secondly, there was somebody in the shade there. I have, no, I have no clue what happened there. Apologies. Now the place where we had uh, we had, the place where we had operated, there was a previous rock fall there. The the island is about fifty five feet in 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 height, and um, the island was very very smelly. There was um, lots of dead crabs around us. There was um, lots of insects. We all got bitten. We all got quite, quite badly, badly bitten. Gone too far here now. And yeah, we had very little, uh, very little shade. We had a tent. We only used it really just to try to keep the sun off our, off ourselves. But the, the temperature went to well over forty degrees inside in the tent. So this is our operating site here, not, not very comfortable, but that wasn't the goal. You can see here just kind of how steep and how, how jagged it actually is. Just some, some local scenery. The QSO started racking up. We worked quite a regular shifts. Myself and Jeremy rotated between SSB and CW. Dom was SSB only. And at, at about midnight, we were at roughly about 950 QSOs. And Jeremy had been on a break. I was on 30 CW. And he came running up as fast as he could, saying there's a police boat coming right at us. And the boat circled, circled the rock several times. And it was at this point when they actually realized as well that they actually couldn't get on the rock either. <laughs> And not only that, that they couldn't get on, but they couldn't get us off either. So, you know, thankfully, Dom had a, uh, a hand with him, and we uh, communicated with him on, on, on VHF. And um, once they knew who we were and that we had permission, we had permission to be on the rock actually for a week. And um, once they realized that everything was OK, they, they bid us farewell, basically, and told us to contact them again on, on VHF if it needed to be. But they had to act on it. Reports came in from the mainland that there were strange sightings and noise and lights coming from this, from this rock. So they were concerned for our safety, basically. They're now, the weather forecast for the coming days was not particularly good either. So at least with this, we, we successfully passed the, uh, the 1,000 QSO mark. Now, conditions, as I mentioned earlier, were fantastic. It is, um, the band was open to kind of EI, JA, uh, VK, North America, all at the same time. So we continued basically through the night. And at sunrise, once again, Jeremy noticed that the big rib was coming straight for us. It was unfortunately time for us to go QRT. And we were completely at this, this uh, skipper's mercy about when to get us off. Um, this day was, was going to be cruise ship day as well. This was quite early in the morning and it was the only possibility he had to actually get us off. So of course then there was a problem that we had to tear down the stations quite fast. We had to, you know, and start making the dangerous journey back again with the cases back down over the rocks and trying to land everything back on, 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 the, on the rock again. So we finished with over uh, 2,200 QSOs in the log. We were, we were QRV for 17 hours, literally. 
We went, um, the last station we worked was a W4, and then we heard an Echo India in the pile up somewhere. And it was um, EI8 BLB was the last, was the last station in the, in the lock, in the log. I don't know, is Liam here or not, but. So yeah, there was a big rush to get down, load the boat, basically return back to Simpson Bay. Now thankfully everyone and everything got landed back safely again in the rock. Now we had to dispose of this equipment that we had bought. Um, we couldn't take it with us. So we used quite a lot of it. We used the generators, the uh, surplus fuel and stuff. We used quite a lot of it uh, to pay for the, uh, for the boat, give a tip to, the, to Pierre, the, the boatman. Of course, friends and family had to be paid for the, for the, for the rib and stuff. And we also had leftover, leftover food. Uh, water, now the water we didn't drink, it was, it was hot over in the rock of course, we had no way to keep it cool. So the rest, yeah, the rest we, we just donated really to the, uh, to the locals. Here's the five of us. For the remaining days we just did the touristy thing around Phyllisburg really. We did a few short uh, trips, we, we did a day trip to St. Bart's, we did another activation from Tintamere Island, NA199. Our sponsors. Now, once again, the, the actual QSO count um, is averaging about three dollars a QSO from any D expedition really at the moment. Be it Navassa, be it you know um, Juan Fernandez, any any uh, any of the the recent D expeditions seem to be running about three dollars. We fell in, in into that category as well. So we are very grateful for our our, our sponsors. We're also grateful to the IOTA committee who have also um, already approved us and, and validated this operation. Here's our license and just documentation that, that we were on the rock. Picture of our QSL card. Dom, trees at 9 is our QSL manager. And there we have it. Any, any questions, anyone? How many miles off the coast is in Ireland have to be disqualified for IOTA? Uh, 1,000 metres. I'm 99 there, yeah, one kilometre now. Yeah, it, it wasn't always that case, but that's, that's, that's what it is at the moment. Do you have any communication on the island to do handhelds? Not handhelds. We, had, we did pick up a, a local SIM card when, when we arrived. We did that with the intention of actually uploading a log every day and stuff like this. But yeah, that was the only communication we had really. It was the other guys' fo phones didn't, uh, their roaming wasn't very successful. Yeah, Carl came from Scotland and, and friends came from um, St. Lucia and their own mobile phones didn't integrate very well with the, with the local networks. Yeah, Brendan? Um, was, would a helicopter have been an option? No, no it's not. I, even though it is very close to the mainland, you couldn't actually land a helicopter on top of it. It's, it's, too much of a point. Now you could probably, if you had, a, if you had your own helicopter, you could drop guys down a rope and, and, and land it that way and equipment in a net, but there'd be no charter company actually, you know, deliver people that way because of safety. So yeah, that's, <coughs> that's about it. And there seemed to be a good distance between the antennas and the operating position. But uh, was that actually the case, or was it just the photographs? Just the photographs, really. Uh, we, when we were packing, we had uh, two different measurements of coax. We had a 50 meter run and a 25 meter run each. And of course, if needed be, you could join the two of them and have a 75 meter run. But um, it was the 25 meter runs were actually used, so they were quite close. But we actually put the antennas up on top of the rock yeah. while we were down low. So yeah. Was that RG58 or was it bigger? Uh, it was the low loss RG58, the, the, the Ecoflex equivalent with the EG7 or whatever it is, Air Cell 7, I think. Yeah. Hey everyone, sorry to interrupt you again. Um, basically, I'd like to thank David for sharing his adventures with us. Thanks very much, David. And Sean, can I call on you to make a small presentation from Sarah? <coughs> thank you. Thank you.